Are you ready? Yeah. I don't know if I'm ready. I haven't done this in a minute. <laughs> I, uh, actually, this is my first podcast I've been on. No Just, way. Yeah, way. Wow. Yeah. That's so exciting. I had no idea. I figured you had to be on at least one. Nope. Dang. Well, welcome. Nope. That's Thank so, you. That's so much more exciting than I thought. <laughs> good to be here <laughs> yeah so uh, everybody welcome back to season two of the kind of consistent podcast um i decided to make it season two because i stopped like a month ago when i thought i'd be running because i used to share the metrics mm-hmm. i was like there's a stat that most episodes or most podcasts end at seven mm-hmm. episodes and then 90 percent fizzle out at 20 gotcha. and i kept like being like yeah I beat the statistic, <laughs> <laughs> and then I just stopped. <laughs> well, it's not called consistent, is it? It's called it, kind of consistent. Exactly. So there you go. I think that's what I'm going to lean to, lean into. So I appreciate you supporting that message, and even just Always. for coming on. So well, thanks for having me. Yeah. So I'll I'll give you a little intro, then we'll dive in. Cool, cool. So today we have a very special guest, the first person to start season two. Which once again, I'm super glad you came on. He's from a true home in Austin, Texas to a newfound home in Boston. Um, Went to Berkeley College of Music, the one in Boston. I always mix it up with the, isn't it California? Yeah, Berkeley, California. Everybody does. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, He, you got signed to Pulse. Was that what it is with Gabe? Pulse Music Group, yeah. As a, was it musician and songwriter? Um, As a songwriter, producer, and artist. Dang, that's so tight. (laughs) And I guess the reason we're here today is because you're touring through the city with Noah mm-hmm. Khan, which is so exciting. I yeah. can't wait to see the show. It's going to be fun. We I can't to wait to see you play banjo. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I just do. Uh, I used to play a couple songs on banjo, but the updated ses- set has me playing it one time. So. Okay. At least once. Yes. At least I can get that. It's just a party trick at that point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What song? Uh, Orange Juice. Dang. Yeah. Does somebody else play it, or is it just nobody plays banjo? Our keys player, Dylan, plays banjo. He oh, He's okay. kind of our utility guy, so he plays keys a lot of the times. Banjo, mandolin, mm-hmm. um, kind of just keeps it to those three. He yeah. sings, too, but he's super talented. Dang. The band's really cool. It's kind of reminiscent of, like, the way Lumineers performs. Oh, cool. They're crazy, yeah. like, jumping cartwheels and flying yeah, and yeah, barefoot yeah, yeah. and stuff. But probably the second like type of energy like that that i've ever seen which is oh, crazy thanks. yeah i mean we you know i the, the difference between that is the lumineers is like you know they're a band and so mm-hmm. oh yeah I guess all we're like, we're the band yeah. playing for noah yeah um, and you want to talk a little closer to the mic yeah we we're the, we're the band for noah and so mm-hmm. um you know we're all very much a family and and love playing together and everything but you know, at the end of the day, our job is to support Noah the best we can. And um, I think that that takes out doing cartwheels and stuff on stage. <laughs> <laughs> a little yeah. bit distracting from him. But you had to focus on the music rather than anything else. Yeah. Um, I was actually going to wait to ask this later on, but we'll do this then dive into like you. Cool. But um, if we were vampires, mm. crazy song. I've like cried to that like 10, 15 times. Yeah. Um, did you perform that live when like Wesley came on? Yeah. So that oh, song what actually, was that like? It was great. That's that song started um, a while ago. I I mean I remember we were in a green room and we were just talking about Noah and I were talking about some of our favorite songs and um, that song came up and uh, one of us had suggested oh that's that's something we should cover and so mm. for a couple shows before that we were. Um, we were covering that. It was just me, Whoa. Dylan, the keys player, and and Noah, three part mm-hmm. harmonies and um, guitar and mandolin, and it was a lot of fun. Yeah. It, it was, you know, when we first started, we were kind of surprised to see. It seemed like not a lot of the crowd really knew that song. I did not know it before it came out as a yeah. single. Yeah. Who's um, it by? It's by Jason Isbell. Whoa! I didn't honestly I have no idea who that is. He is. You should check him out. He's one of the greatest songwriters alive right now. He's incredible. But I've yeah, been a fan for a long like time. that song is like heartbreaking. Yeah. Like. Yeah. Yeah. He's he's incredible. But we started playing that live and then um, Wes came out for the Colorado show to go and do that. And um, 
people loved it and it was a mm-hmm. lot of fun and so they went ahead and made a recording of it in new york together oh so that was before the single released yeah whoa yeah that song is like man like, it's great it's and i think it actually song. like fits perfectly within noah's discography too oh totally because like his lyrics are so like deep out of nowhere like they'll just rk yeah. you off the top ropes and i think i mean noah is so inspired by jason isbell as well so mm-hmm. it, i mean it, i guess it kind of makes sense that his inspirations would fit well into his own discography yeah no, that definitely makes sense yeah. but that's not the main priority i just i got excited <laughs> luminous connect and everything yeah 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 but um yeah so how have you been this is like i know we've been like talking a lot but like how have you been just like as a person like what you've been up to and yeah like where you at right now it's been good um i i i I told you before it's been just a weird 10 months because i you know went from i was a college student very much struggling to Mm -hmm. make it as as an artist and just kind of figuring out my sound and everything did you drop out 10 months ago yeah wow they go on i just didn't know the timeline exactly yeah and um, this opportunity presented itself and um, dropped out of school and my life has been completely different ever since. Mm-hmm. Ve- completely different. And um, obviously for the better, I wouldn't change anything, but um, there's a lot of there's a lot of weird parts of it too. Social aspects with people around you changing how they treat you and um, some of it's disappointing sometimes, but... Mm-hmm. Um, like do you think just for everybody like is it people that you know from school or is it like industry people or is it kind of just everybody it's kind of just everybody i mean if that's tough the 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 one it is it is tough but the 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 benefit so outweighs Mm. the hard part which is i can see so clearly now who like Mm. my real people are my real friends are who have been there forever and you know, don't treat me any differently and um, are just like, they're just my, my friends <laughs> yeah. and I, and I, I love them. And so it's made it really, really clear who those people are to me. Um, but gosh, I'm answering your question like a politician. I'm not even <laughs> answering your question. Um, I'm, <laughs> well, that's I'm, super true. And I'm yeah. glad like, cause we've talked about that a lot, just like off the mic. I think yeah. it's just kind of front of dumb. Yeah. But it is cool that like, being able to do what you do has really like shown the true colors of everything. Yeah. Like of your passions of the totally. people that are in your life. Like a lot of people never get that. Yeah. Like, yeah. Cause if you go to work in insurance, like your relationships won't change. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if you go to work in something that puts you more in the public eye, like mm-hmm. it just will, whether it's yeah. family, friends, just random people off the street, like absolutely. It just by yeah. nature has to change. Yeah. But you know, I've been good. Uh, especially recently summer touring is so much fun Mm -hmm. Um, there's so much like outdoor summer camp type stuff that we're doing playing Mm -hmm. basketball all the time yeah Um, are you a good hooper no (laughs) but (laughs) but I I enjoy it I enjoy it very much yeah and um, especially because none of us are good okay so that makes it easy on us all yeah that's it what was um, your favorite outdoor show and have they all just been outdoor this summer, really? Not all of them, but most of them. Favorite one was Meriwether Post Pavilion in Maryland. Well, um, I figured you'd say Bonnaroo. Didn't you just do Bonnaroo? Bonnaroo was a blast, but Meriwether was um, either that or Boston Calling. Because Meriwether... Oh, the videos from the Boston one look crazy. That was nuts. That was 40,000 people, which is the most people me or Noah has ever played for. Um, really? Yeah. But the one in Maryland was 15,000 people. um, And that was the day after the deluxe came out. And it was just the loudest, most energized crowd I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. Um, It was just, it was really, really special. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess that, like you were just saying before, like that's kind of like your home base and Noah. Boston? Yeah. Yeah, Boston is, yeah. Is Noah from Vermont? He's from Vermont, yeah. So does New England. Yeah. Is that close to Boston? I actually don't know northeastern um, geography. I want to say it's a two-hour drive, maybe four. Okay. So you can, like, false claim that you're from there. Yeah. If you're close enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're all from Boston. Yeah, you know? we're all from Boston. Yeah. Yeah, I don't even know where I'd say I'm from. 
because I say Cleveland, but it's mm-hmm. like 45 minutes from me. Yeah. Nobody knows where I'm from. I mean, I say Austin's such a big, I'm from Austin, and mm-hmm. it's such a big um, <coughs> place, but truthfully, I'm about. <laughs> the truth comes out. <laughs> I'm like, well, yeah, I'm like a 35, 40 minute drive west of Austin. Okay. Is that so closer to Dallas? Like not no. like is it Dallas like is like four hours away. Okay, because my so. other brother actually lives in Dallas. Oh, That's rad. the only place I've really been. In yeah, Texas. I'm just west Austin, so like okay, not any closer. Just moving laterally. Yeah, what's the like if I go to Austin for the first time, like what's the place I have to go to? Because I've I know nothing about Austin. Oh man. Whether it's like food, whether it's like a venue, whether it's like a cowboy boot store. Um, God, there's so much good food that I love there, but. Barton Springs is like anytime I have a friend visiting Austin for the first time, it's where I always take them. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just this big natural spring um, that's kind of like built like a ginormous pool and um, Mm -hmm. in the heart of Zilker Park, which is where they do ACL. Oh, I've always um, wanted to go to Austin City Limits. Yeah. And then to see Daniel Caesar. Yeah. I watched like the live version of that so much. I was like, I need to see him specifically play there. Right, (laughs) right. Um, but Barton Springs is, that's, I mean, it's just a good summer vibe. Mm-hmm. Um, food, I'm trying to think, barbecue, Salt Lick, which is like way out there, not in like central Austin, but my favorite barbecue place as well. Hmm. I might hit you up for a reminder on that when Go I come. For it. But yeah, yeah, no, that's very good to know. If I'm in town, I'll, I'll take you there myself. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be awesome. I'd definitely love to visit you there and... Mm-hmm like where you land next yeah um but yeah i kind of wanted to dive into i don't know because we like know each other just like through talking over the internet for how long do you think probably like maybe a year maybe more when did you drop mission failed like more than uh i dropped mission failed in either november or december i think it was november it was definitely like deep fall oh yeah 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 Yeah. Yeah. november i want to say Dang, yeah. I feel like we had to know each other a little bit before that. I feel like we did. I don't remember the moment. Because you, I remember you, you liked Street Fighter. A oh, while Street Fighter is a banger. And that was like, I think, I want to say like February of last year. Dang. Um, so I think it's been a while. I think it's yeah, a, yeah, probably around a year. We could yeah. ballpark a year. Yeah, we'll say that. <laughs> Dang. So like really that's all I have to work on is kind of just, especially what you've like shared with like the public. Mm-hmm. So, how'd you go from Austin to Berkeley, and then, then I guess we can just get into like why you dropped out and kind of like how you feel since yeah. like it's all happened. Well, and I also am super curious about like how you started working with Gabe because mm-hmm. I'm assuming that's intertwined with that story. Yeah, so I can give the whole you the whole wanna? rundown. I uh, I grew up in Austin, um, just kind of in your run of the mill white suburban neighborhood yeah um (laughs) 35 minutes out the big city yeah exactly (laughs) (laughs) and um i loved living there though i was really fortunate to have um am really fortunate to have parents that love me and love each other and um i had a really nice childhood and uh my whole mission throughout middle school and high school was to do as many music things as i could to get um my goal was to get a scholarship to Berkeley. I wanted to get to Berkeley. Dang. When um, do you, like, form that goal? Uh, I think, like, seventh grade. Whoa. Yeah. I, like, I always knew I wanted to do music. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was always, I always felt pressured to tell people that I didn't want to do music and I wanted to do something more stable, but mm. wanted to do music as a hobby just because, you know, I grew, grew up my whole life as a people pleaser and mm-hmm. um, telling people that I wanted a career in music wasn't always the most pleasing thing for people to yeah, hear. It's very easy to get backlash on. Yeah. And so um, I really came to terms with, with music being what I wanted to do um, like seventh or eighth grade. And like at that point you were like confident and like telling people like, yeah, I want to do music like that. Yeah. It. Yeah, Dang. exactly. But I hit that like a year ago. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it uh, it takes some time sometimes, but yeah, I, was, that's crazy. I was lucky to have my parents be really supportive of that. Mm-hmm. Um, it goes a long way. It really Super does. Long way. Yeah, and um, you know, I did. I was putting out music in high school. I had um, 
I put out my first, I think I put out my first EP in eighth grade, um, wow. which is not thankfully <laughs> not available for anybody's ears <laughs> <Yeah>. currently. <laughs> but it was, you know, it was integral in me figuring out and learning how to do stuff and mm-hmm. the first step in finding my sound. Yeah. Um, was it under no one in the open or like, did you have was. another alias? It was under no one in the open. Wow. And yeah. why did that, like why no one open? Why are you in the open and not in the closed? Or like, what's the um, story? It's really not as interesting as as some would hope. But doesn't need to I, be. Uh, <laughs> I, when I first decided I wanted to do music, um, I remember talking to one of my music teachers, um, and I was like, "Well, you know, what should I do? Should I be Noah Levine?" And at the time, I wanted to be. I wanted to form a band. I wanted mm-hmm. to form a band to come up with me, um, and write music together and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I felt weird naming a band Noah Levine, yeah. Just because, like, you know, <laughs> it's it's not a band name; that's an artist name. So, yeah, no, that's a tough one um, to juggle. I decided on Noah in the open, um, mainly because my eighth grade self thought it sounded cool. Does it um, still hold up, in your opinion? It, <laughs> I was questionable about it for a while, but mm-hmm. it really is. It really, I've kind of grown into the name. Where it's, mm-hmm. it is synonymous with who I am. Definitely. Especially yeah. if it's been like your Instagram handle for so long. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I never I never want to base my artistic vision off of my Instagram handle. But yeah, I think the I think the idea of of that name just kind of fits me mm-hmm. and it has over time. But can um, I spit like a philosophical take on no one open? Yeah, please. This will be <laughs> great for me to tell people in the future when they ask why I named it that. Like, oh, it's actually this really philosophical. Mm-hmm. So There's a big reason. I'm all, you know? I'm all ears. <laughs> so it kind of just goes relating to the, all the conversations we've had that just like when you really get into music and start putting yourself out there in the public eye, you just become super vulnerable mm-hmm. and like you don't necessarily know how certain people feel and you just kind of are willingly putting yourself in that place to be exposed, to be in the public eye and to be yourself in the open. It's and that's like Noah in the open. Exactly. And that's exactly how I felt when I was a kid first releasing music. Um, I was in, you know, I was in this suburban neighborhood where mm-hmm. everybody either does finance <laughs> or, yeah. You know, I can like just these sure. everyone was so pressured to do um salaried jobs, like things that would make you consistent money, like a clean like a STEM major or something. And I did feel really vulnerable the first time I was telling people that like this is what I wanna do. I don't know if it'll work out, but mm-hmm. I'm putting everything into it. Yeah. So you're still going, man. Yeah. <laughs> Love to see it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, I guess so. How like just continue to tell that story if I got to Berkeley? Like, yeah, so I I kept releasing music in high school, and you know I did marching band, jazz band, chamber choir, everything I could do to mm-hmm. make myself as appealing as I could to Berkeley. And um, in my I think my senior year of high school, I want to say, I met um, a guy named Jeffrey Hassan. He's a uh, he's the head of the um, Nashville office at uh, United Talent Agency UTA, and um, which is a booking agency. They're, I was about to ask what that is. I have no idea. Yeah, there <laughs> it's it's a really um, renowned music agency for booking shows and everything. And um, his his clients are like he he does Dayglow, Coin, um, mm. Young the Giant. Rustin Kelly, mm-hmm. um, just names that I've I've always been inspired by. Yeah, those are some amazing artists. Yeah, and um, I connected with him through a mutual friend, um, and initially I just I just asked him like I just wanted to connect with him to get some advice, like mm-hmm. how like how what direction do I move? What am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? And um, he was gracious enough to do a deep dive of all my music that was out, which was not great at the time. And, um, and all my socials and everything. This was, um, 
actually think my junior year of high school, okay. junior or senior year of high school. Um, and he, he, this was before House Arrest released. This is before okay. that whole EP was out. Is that like the earliest single on No One Open right now? Um, where's the <coughs> earliest? I think there's the Nostalgia EP, which is just like okay. a collection of my favorite songs from old stuff that I released that I okay. just plucked out and put out. Yeah. Um, but he was like, Hey, listen, like you're doing all the right things. Um, the music is good. I don't hear any, I don't like, I don't hear anything crazy, but you're on the way there. Like you're young. Mm -hmm. Um, do you have anything unreleased that I could listen to? And so I sent him that finished EP, which had house arrest, um, San Francisco, um, bunch of songs that I was really proud of at the time. And mm -hmm. he loved it. And I signed with him two weeks later. Wow. And, um, I got a great scholarship to Berkeley and I went there and, um, Jeffrey's sort of vision with me was, was he was going to be, um, helping to develop me. And mm -hmm. he still has been, he's like still my right hand guy. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, he wanted to start from the beginning and help develop me as an artist and as a creative. And he connected me with Gabe, um, about two years ago. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I met with him to work on some of my own stuff as an artist and he's an incredible mm -hmm. producer and writer. Yeah. Um, who is Gabe? Like Gabe Simon just cause like I know. Yeah. He's, um, he's a producer, like on paper, he's a producer and writer. Um, and an artist as well. He's been signed with Pulse for eight years now. Mm -hmm. um, not on paper. He is like a crazy, creative Muppet with <laughs> with the most contagious, amazing energy mm -hmm. um, that I was instantly pulled in by the first time I worked with him. And so um, as a producer myself and, and writer, I uh, after that, a couple months later, I texted him and was like, hey, remember me? It's Noah. Um, I would love to, I don't know if you ever had an intern before, but I would love to intern for you, just shadow you. Um, I'll clean your studio. I'll get you coffee, take out trash, whatever. You don't have to pay me. Mm -hmm. um, I'll find my own place to stay. I just, I want to watch you work and I want to see how you do it. And mm -hmm. um, it took a lot of, a lot of following up and convincing. And mm -hmm. I think if, he had had it his way at the time he would have successfully ghosted me. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. but I was annoying and persistent and, um, he thanks me for it every day, but mm -hmm. I was, I was really, really persistent about it. And I finally annoyingly locked in two weeks this past August with him. Mm -hmm. Um, and last those year. two weeks unpaid as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Unpaid. Um, I didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I, uh, found my own place to stay. Um, and so I locked it in with him and, uh, we were working together and, and well, not working together. He was working. I was cleaning a studio. He mm. had me <laughs> like, he had me building, uh, furniture and stuff out of spare wood. And he had in his garage just for like to find stuff for me to do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he knew, he knew I was a guitar player. And so, um, like, second or third day in he turned around and he goes it'd be kind of stupid if i didn't use you for what you're actually good at right and i was like sure i mean <laughs> you're, i'm here for you to use me however you want and so yeah <laughs> um he started having me play guitar on his artist sessions that he was working on and so i was playing guitar on stuff um i ended up playing saxophone on some stuff because that's what i did in high school Damn. and um i had to learn cello on the spot and, <laughs> and did some stuff there. And, um, around the second week rolled around and Noah, Noah Khan was supposed to come mm -hmm. down, um, to finish the stick season album. The single had released, but the rest of the album was unfinished and they were working on it. Mm -hmm. And, um, Noah came down and, uh, I went in there just kind of to be a fly on the wall and, Mm -hmm. I met Noah. He was super nice. Not at all how I expected him to be. Mm -hmm. um, I think I imagined him a lot older. Mm. Um, how old is he? He's 26. Oh, dang. Yeah. I imagined him a lot older and more like soft-spoken just because his songwriting yields that energy. Mm -hmm. 
and he comes in he he walks in the door of the studio and he's like hey man just finished a game of golf like let's let's fucking get this thing going and yeah. i was like oh so this is you yeah. <laughs> and so um we were working on uh the focus of the day was to to record growing sideways and Dang. to finish homesick and so um i just kind of helped out like setting up microphones and stuff for growing sideways. I brought him tea. <laughs> um, what kind of tea? Do you remember? Oh, gosh. Probably throat coat. Mm. That's what we have on the road. But um, I always wondered. Yeah, it's so good. Yeah. So good. Um, and then homesick, we were doing that. And um, Noah didn't like the way that the solo was sounding on it. And so Gabe just handed me the guitar and said, let's let him try. And so... Dang. I took like two or three takes and um, he kept the solo that I played and I was ecstatic. I was like, oh my God, my, you know, my mm -hmm. guitar is on this incredible record. And um, I went back to Berkeley and um, was at school for about four weeks there. And I got a call at like 7 a.m. Um, from Gabe and it was like, hey, um, Noah wants a guitar player for tour. And he asked for you. You'd have to drop out of school, um, and you'd have to decide by tomorrow. Whoa! And so I was like, "Whoa, okay." <laughs> Can I call my parents real quick? He's like, "Yep, clock's ticking." And he, he hangs literally up said and that. I, yeah, and he <laughs> hangs up, and I'm like, "Oh my god!" So I <laughs> I called my parents, and um, their only reaction was, "You have to do this. Like, this is what you have to do. Like, yeah. you don't need a music degree." What are you gonna do with a music degree besides mm. like teach or something? So yeah. um I dropped out the next day and and um let Noah's manager Drew flew up um to Boston and, mm. and I met him and we went to a concert together and um I'm realizing like that's so funny. I'm going on a tangent here, but Nice. Um, I'm happy to hear it. Noah just <laughs> hired a bunch of new people on the crew just because the tour is getting bigger and everything. And he was telling me about like everyone was asking so many questions like, you know, what's the what's the vibe on the road? Is there a big party scene? Like mm -hmm. what's everybody's energy like? And I realized <laughs> I realized I asked no questions when I <laughs> dropped out of school and yeah. joined. Like I I'd never toured before. Yeah. Um, I'd never played a show bigger than. 200 people um i asked no questions and i just did it and i always <laughs> laugh about that because like it could have been a really horrible situation where i've just dropped out of school and i'm with a bunch of people that i don't like and don't like mm -hmm. me but i really lucked out and it's like the best group of people ever mm -hmm. but um you know i i've been on the road with him for 10 months since then and um he's really influenced like my the songs I was releasing and writing before this um, were very like indie pop. Um, you know, there was a limit to how much depth I was going with my songwriting. Um, and after joining Noah, he really like influenced and introduced me to a whole world of how much you can connect to an audience with words. Mm -hmm. And so I've kind of been evolving in this genre phobic state where I'm making, I'm finally now making the music I want to be making. And, mm -hmm. you know, if it means me going dark on releasing stuff for about a year, then, you know, I'll have to come back swinging. And mm -hmm. that's what I plan on doing at the start yeah. of next year. So it'll be a new phase of no one out there. It will. Yeah. yeah. Now I'm excited for that. Yeah. Um, a couple questions going back mm -hmm. are what was your relationship with Gabe like at the time of him saying, drop out, the clock's ticking? So that's like, I th two, three I, no, weeks? Yeah. Um, like, how much do you, like, trust <laughs> in, like, our, that's not a lot of blind faith in someone you don't know well. He and I got really close when I was working with him in Nashville. Um, was all of this recording in Nashville? Yeah, this was all okay. in Nashville. And he, like, he really took me under his wing, and um, he's just one of those guys that's, he's a human behind the board and everything like he mm -hmm. you know he's got kids he's got a wife and um his favorite thing is to go tend to the garden behind his studio and he's just mm -hmm. like he's a real person and 
he and I connected really, really well, and he truly believed in me um, ever since then. Like, almost immediately when I got on the road with Noah, he asked Pulse if he could start a joint venture with them and sign me as his first and only artist. And um, mm. that's what happened, and they trusted him, and he trusted me, and um, I just signed my publishing deal with – it's a co-publishing deal with Gabe's joint venture and pulse mm -hmm. and um it's just it's a lot of trust and he's really been the guy who took me under his wing and 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 showed me is showing me how everything works and um he's been a safe person to make mistakes with and learn from them and mm -hmm. move forward and yeah i i felt com i i think when he asked me to drop out and and do that, I think at the time it was more, my relationship with him was more of like a, like I still admire him, but it was more of like an admiration, like you are God type of thing. I'll do yeah. whatever you say, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Which is, uh, could have potentially been a really scary place to be. But yeah. um, I had a gut feeling and that's the part that I, of, of music with myself that I trust the most is mm -hmm. any gut feeling I have. And I had one with him and I'm glad I did because it's worked out like almost perfectly. Yeah. That's amazing. Cause it really could have gone South. It could have. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't mind uh, Horatio in the background, <laughs> but um, yeah, that could have gone a lot more South. Mm -hmm. That'd be, it's beautiful that it did work out. Cause a lot of people yeah. could be put in that situation and just abuse it. And unfortunately yeah. it's common. So I'm glad and it I, wasn't for you. Yeah, and I always I always prefer to find myself in the position of, you know, if I do something and I'd rather I'd rather regret doing something than regret not doing something. Mm -hmm. You know. Thankfully I'm in the position where I don't have to do either of that. Yeah. But, for sure. You know, if I had said no, I need to get my degree, my entire life would have been thinking about, well, what happened? What would have happened if, I, like, what if, if I did that? Yeah. Man. Yeah, and I always try to avoid that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as you should, because they're only on this earth for so long. So yeah, we gotta yeah. use it while we can. Mm -hmm. And then one other question going back is, so like homesick was like the guitar was decided to be used. Mm -hmm. Like, how did that feel? And also, how does it feel now playing it? Because there's probably some sort of disconnect if you're playing someone else's music that you had no part in. Mm -hmm. And like with homesick you very evidently like step up on the stage while you play it, you jam out. Like mm. how did it feel at first and how have you grown to feel about that now? Um, it, I mean, that song held a special place in my heart. Still does. I mean, um, that was something that uniquely I had, you know, when playing on the stage, it, it is, it is something different to play songs that, I had no part of and you know I'm hired to play this music but to be able to play songs off a record that I had um, a lot to do with especially this deluxe this deluxe album I um, I just have so much more emotion invested in these songs because I got to watch and help nurture them to life with that incredible team and and mm -hmm. it's it, it it does feel more personal mm -hmm. than other stuff that I haven't been a part of, you know? Mm -hmm. Also, one thing that I wanted to tell you is you texted me the day you wore the kind of consistent shirt in the deluxe recording. Yeah. I had like a ton of plans for that day. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm going to go like work on this content thing. I'm going to do whatever. But when you told me that, I just started crying. No way. Because it's just like, like I started this thing probably like two, like two years and three months ago. And, like, having, like, my merch being in the place of, like, an artist that I, like, love mm -hmm. is, like, unbelievable. Like, yeah. when that happened, like, my whole day was just, like... He loves that shirt. Oh I God. wear it all the time on the road. Dang. And uh, he he didn't know what it was at first. And he's like, oh, that mm -hmm. shirt's hilarious. I love that. And I was like, oh, it's yeah. actually, like, it's it's one of my friend's things. And he's like, oh, that's sick. So Dang. No, yeah. I freaked out, bro. So that really just, like, does mean a lot that you support. Cause there's just a lot of, of people course. that like don't 
<laughs> yeah, I, I <laughs> mean, just really nice. I I know what it's like to be a passionate creative with um yourself being the only one who believes in you at the time, and you know, obviously you're in a great place now where where you're on the rise and everything. But mm. I always like I know what that feels like, so I always want to support things that I'm passionate about in their early stages because mm -hmm. you know who else is going to yeah, yeah. for sure no it means a lot bro for real yeah of course so thank you for that um but just also staying on like the idea of the deluxe album uh we'll get into dial drunk obviously because mm -hmm. that's like more of your baby than anything mm -hmm. um what else did you like play a part in because I think there's at least one other song yeah that you like so directly helped with you're gonna go far I played guitar on that. Um, all the baritone stuff at the end and throughout the song, um, I played on that one. Uh, no Complaints was actually, it's really interesting how that song was born. So we, we were in the middle of recording Dial Drunk, and um, it was me, uh, this girl Carrie, who was playing drums, amazing producer and drummer, Mm -hmm. And um, Noah was in the room, and Gabe was in the room playing bass. And um, Noah didn't like the guitar he was playing for Dial Drunk, so he was in the middle of changing it, and he grabbed this other guitar, and he started playing the beginning of No Complaints, um, a song that hadn't been written yet. Mm -hmm. And he was playing it, and then Gabe started following along on the bass. Carrie started a drum groove. I had a slide, so I started playing slide guitar, and... Mm -hmm. He just started improvising these lyrics on the spot in the room and like 70% of the finished lyrics on that song are words that, and, and our engineer kept recording mm -hmm. um, cause like, you know, yeah, a you moment gotta, like that happens, you got to capture it. And so like 70% mm -hmm. of the lyrics he was just spitting out are the words that are on the song. And so we all kind of, that song was born through all of us just feeling it in the room at the mm -hmm. time and you know took a tangent away from dial drunk and made that song right in the middle of it so Dang. i got to ha i had a part in that you're gonna go far um and then dial drunk mm -hmm. yeah and because we kind of already like talked a little bit about like the thing i read up in she's about dial drunk mm -hmm. but how did that all come together and like I don't know just where is it now for you because we'll get into like the success it's had but yeah kind of like how did that come together how do you look at that song yeah i um basically um noah lives or er, lives in boston lives in watertown um i live in back bay and so um, i introduced him a while ago to all my friends and um, he got along with them really well my roommates and he came mm -hmm. over to come play basketball with us and just come hang out for a bit. And um, before he came over, he texted me and was like, you know, should we make music or something? And I was like, sure. Not really like thinking about it or whatever. And he came over, we played basketball and um, he was like, you want to, you want to write something? So I was like, sure. So we went up to my room into my like minimal little apartment <laughs> studio with half of my gear in Austin and right here <laughs> or there. And, um, we he brought his he brought the banjo over and he's like yeah I, I came up with this lick and it's that beginning lick you hear at the beginning of the mm -hmm. song i was like oh that's sick and so i grabbed my acoustic and um found the chords that went over it and and mm -hmm. we were playing that and then we were just kind of riffing off some melodies together and um ended up settling on the verse melody and um we ended up writing that song in like 30 minutes and um, I had produced a demo out in there just to like have it and we had it at the end mm -hmm. and recorded it and everything and um, it sounds very different than the released version now. The one I did was a little more acoustic and mm -hmm. um, more intimate but um, and then the actual version is like this killer rockin' I mean, you, you know the song, mm -hmm. but, um, great song. <laughs> um, we did that and we finished and it was like, okay, 
that was fun. <laughs> and um, went on with your day. Yeah, went on with our day, and he went home, and I went to bed, and um, God, Harushio is acting. I know today. he's going crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I, um, Jeffrey is is um, has always been my right hand guy, the guy at UTA, and um, you know I just keep him updated with everything. I was like, hey, I wrote a, wrote a song with Noah yesterday. So mm-hmm. I sent it to him, and he was the first person to be like, "This is really fucking good. Mm-hmm. This is really good." And I was at first, I was like, "Really?" Because <laughs> mm-hmm. like we weren't like ecstatic about it, but it was like we like I liked the song. Yeah. And he said it was really fucking good, and then um, it got in the hands of Gabe and Noah's team, and they were like, "We have to record this for real. Like this is a great song." Mm-hmm. And so um, that's what happened, and and. I remember we posted it. I came over to his house and we posted like a, a video of it unreleased me playing banjo, like in the back of his car. And, um, it didn't go crazy viral or anything. It was just kind of like, you know, ran its course. It was fine. Um, it didn't go nuts or anything. And then I remember, um, a couple weeks ago, like before it came out, he released or he, posted a thing on TikTok and it just went absolutely insane. Mm-hmm. Like so, so much attention. And that's been really weird for me to process because I've never had something even close to that before. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't think it's something I'll ever be able to process, but yeah, I guess way bigger than anything you could even fathom. Yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cause to date, I think it's number 43 on the hot 100. Yeah. And the album itself is number three on like the, billboard 200 yeah like that's and he's it's the number one alternative album on billboard right now wow which is really wild really really cool Mm -hmm. but man and just to say you've even played like whether it's a little or the bigger part in the deluxe is like an unbelievable thing yeah definitely something you should be really proud of even if like it's hard to like fully take that in like that's just an amazing thing yeah like honestly like super proud of you for that like thank you crazy thank you (laughs) Yeah, no, that's nuts. Um, but yeah, how is performing Dial Drunk? Because didn't you play it at your show in Boston? We did. Mm-hmm. That was the first live debut. Was I had my my own sold out show in Boston, and um, this was like shortly after we wrote it. And Noah's always like, God, he's always been so supportive of me and my music, and and he's re- he's just so supportive kind of like an older brother to me mm-hmm. and I never had brothers and so I cherish that relationship but I remember before that he came out to my house show in Boston where like there were like 50 people packed into a living room and he mm-hmm. came out and supported and sang if we were vampires with me Dang. and um, <laughs> that second show um, a couple months later in Boston um, I asked if he wanted to come out and and sing the song we wrote together and that was the first debut of the song we sang dial drunk together with my band and um it was it was really really special it was Mm -hmm. awesome and um like playing it now is just incredible i always we added a, a a last chorus on the end of the song just for like the audience to sing and I take out my in ears every time just to like mm. bathe in the sound. Yeah. Cause like that's, <laughs> it's, uh, I, I'm so aware of how unique of an experience and unique of a, of just a thing that that is, um, for me. And so I, I try and soak it in every night that I can. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Honestly, almost every time I listen to it now, especially when I hear it in my head, I still hear your voice because of the videos I watched of the Boston show. Well, I my like voice is in it like, too. On like the actual recording. Yeah. I thought I was just hearing things. But no, that was I, really <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, I sang backup on that as well. I yeah. played, I I'm played, glad I'm not insane. I like 100% no. <laughs> heard. It. I'm like, I'm just hearing things. <laughs> no, on the actual recording, I played banjo, mm-hmm. um, baritone, electric guitar, um, one of the acoustic guitars. Um, and I, saying some backgrounds on it as well okay you have no idea how like validating that is to my mind (laughs) (laughs) oh great (laughs) no that's really cool that one definitely just something that's just like 
an awesome byproduct of you co-writing that song. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, in general, I don't want to like make this all about Noah because I'm sure a lot of your life is about yeah. Noah Khan <laughs> right now. So one thing I'm super curious about is uh, I, actually before Wait. that, is there? Did I forget anything? It's okay. a good look. My bad. <laughs> and then I did space. We'll just keep going until cool. that stops. We'll just keep an eye on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, is there anything else you want to like say about working with Noah? Whether it's like something you've learned, something you're excited for, and then we'll just dive into some other stuff. Well, there's a lot to be excited for mm-hmm. just because he's on this rocket ship of a career right now. And I'm lucky to have to have jumped on right as it was taken off. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's, he's just, I can't say enough good things about him. He's mm-hmm. been, um, truly like an older brother to me through this whole thing. And, you know, just so supportive. And, you know, he, he pulled me aside after our, um, one of our shows in Boston and was like, Hey, just want you to know. So you can have some peace of mind. Like I want to have you play for me as long as possible but I also know you're an artist who will need to do your own thing at some point and I want you to know when that time comes you have my full support Mm -hmm. to be able to break off and do that when you need to you know which is great to hear you know in in a perfect world I'd play for him forever and still be able to do my own stuff at the level I want to but Mm -hmm. we all know it's not a perfect world yeah so and if anything, it's just beautiful that you've been able to, like, be on that ride at all. So, yeah. just something to be super thankful about. And yeah, yeah. So, big shout out to Noah. Yeah, <laughs> very much. But um, honestly, I feel like we're gonna do more podcast stuff in the future. And I know that, especially being signed to Pulse and working with Gabe, like the artists you work with, will just keep continuing yeah. to grow. So I think we'll save that for just whenever the next time is. Yeah. But I do have questions outside of that. Cool. It's more about you. Yeah. So. One thing that I'm always so curious about is, is it hard to play guitar with rings? Um, Cause I've like tried a lot. Like I tried to get into a ring phase, like yeah. know, try to get my type of eye for it, but I just, it's not comfortable. Like, what is that like for you? I only wear rings on my right hand because oh, okay. it's easy. It doesn't get in the way with my right hand stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I tried to leave them on for my left hand, but they get in the way and I always get worried about like scratching or denting the neck when I do mm-hmm. that. So I don't wear rings on this hand. Mm-hmm. So it's a calculated decision. Yes. Okay. That's good to know. Cause yeah. I have tried so many times. It does <laughs> not work. <laughs> yeah. Um, another question I have is, um, where do you get the majority of your clothes? Cause my clothes, every single time I see like, whether it's a video of you playing photos, like your style is crazy. Oh, thank you. From, like <laughs> accessories to just general clothing. Like kind of like, where do you get your clothes? Oh gosh. Well, first of all, I have my girlfriend to credit for the way I dress because mm, before I, her, I hear that. <laughs> before her, I was dressing like a, you know, I was in middle school. I was that highlighter kid wearing the neon mm. Nike stuff, mm, the stuff. Nike elites. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But cargo um, shorts. <laughs> yeah, but um, I I thrift everything, mm-hmm. um, mainly with the help of her. Cause mm-hmm. I just, I go with her whenever I go and she has a great eye for that stuff. And, um, my girlfriend's the same way. Yeah. Everything <laughs> I thrift. This is actually my grandma's shirt. Um, I have a couple awesome concert t-shirts that my grandma at my grandma's house, mm-hmm. um, she just had in the closet and was like, take whatever you want. And so this Dang. is hers. Um, it's a super cool shirt. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, Shout out to grandma. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it's all thrifted stuff. You know, I've gotten better at developing my own eye for things, but I definitely have my girlfriend, Sophia, to credit for that stuff. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's good. Yeah, your style is really dope. So. Oh, thank you. Hard thing to do. I've really been trying to refine mine lately. Give me both. <laughs> I, still, I still feel like I'm, I dress awkwardly sometimes. Yeah, but. definitely. Same. <laughs> More often than not, I feel that way, but the yeah. days of feeling good are starting to be like closer together, Yeah, <laughs> which is nice. Um so honestly, even just pivoting off a girlfriend thing is we just talked about my girlfriend getting me a katana mm-hmm. and I've always wanted a katana because I grew up watching movies like Zombieland. Yeah. So just like apocalypse type stuff and even like The Walking Dead. Mm-hmm. And in my mind, I'm just like, I need 
my ideal apocalypse weapon yeah which is the katana mm-hmm. and i've asked for the katana for like three years that's my mom and my grandma they're like never mm-hmm. like even when i got it my mom said is this real <laughs> you're just like freaked out yeah. um but my question is what would your ideal apocalypse weapon be oh gosh um I don't know, I because I remember you posting about that, and I was like, I feel like it is every man's dream to own a sword mm-hmm. of some sort. And For I sure. like, <laughs> I was always so into pirates when I was a kid, and I like, my parents were very like, anti weapons of any sort in the house. Mm-hmm. Like, it took a lot if they even bought me like a Nerf gun or something. <laughs> yeah, just um, to emulate that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, um, dude, I, I. Not a katana specifically, but a sword of some sort. Mm-hmm. I've always been like, oh, it'd be so cool to just like, mm-hmm. you know, I feel like I feel like that's been a fantasy of mine since I was a little kid. Mm-hmm. And especially yeah. like in an apocalypse setting, yeah. like you can't get like constant reloads of like ammo. If yeah. you have any type of thing like that with a right. sword, just get like a rock, sharpen exactly. that thing, meditate exactly. while you do it. Bow and arrows are sick too. I feel yeah. like that'd be rad. Oh, those are tight. Yeah. Do you have a sword tattooed on your arm? I don't. It's a it's a stick. Ah, I decided I, I w- thinking about that. Actually, I decided I want to get a uh, um, a unique figurine tattoo for every unique tour that I go on, and so mm. um, this one's special to me because this was what brought me into the touring world. And so mm-hmm. stick season. Is that yeah. your only tattoo? I have this one as well. What does that say? If you don't mind um, me asking. When your sky is gray, I will give you blue. It's a Alan Stone lyric. Um, mm. I was really close with my grandpa, and he passed away a couple of years ago. And mm-hmm. um, I got this this song just emulates who he was to me, and um, I got it in my grandma's handwriting. Mm. So, dang, yeah. those are good tattoos. Thank you. It's well done. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are you listening to right now? Ryan Beatty. You know are Ryan you listening Beatty? to Bruises Off the Peach? Is I'm listening, listening to that whole to? album, Calico. Yeah, I still haven't listened to the whole album, but Dude. Bruises Off the Peach is one of the best songs of the year. I'm a, I am, yeah, I am obsessed with that whole album. It is so good. Um, Medium Build, I'm listening to as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like he just makes honest music, and mm-hmm. it's so refreshing to me. Yeah. Um, I love Medium Build. Love Ryan Beatty. Those are the two right now that I have just kind of cycling through. There's also, um, I feel like I should shout this out. There's this guy um, in Colorado. I think he's from, or no, I think he's in California. I don't know. He goes to school mm-hmm. with one of my friends who's from Colorado, but his name's Ace Landauer. I think I'm saying I've his name right. Definitely heard of that. He Probably has from like, your story. He has like 134 monthly listeners or something. And like, Damn. he's got like, there's like nobody listening to his music, but it's so cool. It's mm-hmm. like great musicians folk music, if I would say. It's like mm-hmm. f- indie folk, but like you can tell he can fucking play. Yeah, he can play well, and um, I just love it. I I so many times I just put his entire discography um, on shuffle and just listen all the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, I talked to him a while ago, and um, he doesn't know exactly what he wants to do with with music and everything, but I love the music he makes. Mm-hmm. He's great. Do you have a like specific song rack of his? Grave Digger. Grave Digger. It's his, it's his most popular one, but it's my favorite one as well. Mm-hmm. It's got this cool little instrumental, almost Irish sounding break in there that's just like fun to listen to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I'm with that. Do you have any of your friends that you think are like going to blow up here soon? Yeah. Because, I mean, we have, I don't know, Joe Jomber, but like, a lot of his last few releases are amazing. And I yeah. know he opened for you at your Boston show and yeah. his friends. So yeah. Do you have anybody, like, whether it's including him and on, that you want to shed some light on? Yeah, I think he's great. I like biggest reason I had him open for me was because I saw videos of his live shows and his energy is just like awesome. Mm-hmm. Just like a great energy to get a crowd excited and, and ready for a show. And I love I would watch him live anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and Think Too Hard is probably one of my favorite songs of 2022. Yeah. yeah. I freaked out hearing that song. Yeah. my uh, It's so funny. My my girlfriend found his music and was a fan of his music before he even before she even knew that I knew him. 
Wow. Uh, which is cool because he's like a he's a pretty small artist as well. Mm-hmm. Um, Arthur's great. He's one of those guys that like he's going to be successful with whatever he wants to do. I mean, he's a great producer. He's so driven. Um, his artist project is really cool. It's really unique and just like uniquely him. Um, I also like that's my roommate, art class, right? Art class, yeah. Um, one of my roommates, his name's Omri, but he has a artist project called Soul Boy, and um, he's not really he hasn't released music yet. But I've heard all mm. of the stuff that he has done and everything, and it's like the coolest, coolest music. I think he's gonna do really, really well. Um, I'm trying to think. A lot of my friends are just like, not all of them want to be artists. Like some of them mm. want to be producers or engineers and or writers. And so like I, I just think they're all gonna be so successful with whatever mm. they want to do. Yeah, yeah. No, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, best place to eat in Boston, and also thoughts on a Boston cream pie. Mm. I don't have many thoughts on that, to be honest. I'm not really? like I'm not a huge cake or pie person, which I mm. know is controversial sometimes. Super controversial. I know. I think I know. you're about to get canceled. I'm an ice cream guy, <laughs> and hopefully that's redeeming enough. But, um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Favorite place to eat in Boston? There's this uh, this Vietnamese place called Pho Basil, which was like right across from my dorm. It's like the best pho I've ever had. It's mm-hmm. so good, and it's probably like probably my favorite spot to go um because it's cheap and it's so good but Mm -hmm. yeah that's where i always try to go back whenever i visit boston Mm -hmm. i like that um what's the biggest thing you've learned from dropping out of college because how old are you now is it 20 or 21 20 20 so how Um, does it feel because like it's definitely become more common people either like dropping out or not Mm-hmm. But especially it's hard when you start it and then you leave and even just the expectations that are on you, opinions from yeah. other people. I think the thing with college, especially Berkeley, schools like Berkeley, music schools, it's one of those things where you realize that while a college education is helpful, it's no longer necessary. Mm-hmm. You know, I, th- I think... I don't think a college degree is useless. I think all the classes that you take and the knowledge that you gain is great. And it's mm-hmm. like, you know, if I had stayed all four years at Berkeley, I'd be a lot smarter than I am <laughs> now. I'd know a lot more about the recording and engineering world and everything. Um, but it's not necessary. I'm getting mm-hmm. the I'm getting more of an education in the field doing the work than I was they're learning Mm -hmm. and so i don't know i i never i never try to sway people one way or the other because berkeley i think berkeley and college in general is really good for some people like there's some good friends of mine that i think going to school there is really good for them Mm -hmm. um even if they were to find an opportunity to get them out like i think there's some people it's good for them to be there and to stay and to get that education and there's some people i know that really don't need to be there where they'll benefit from the education but if they have an opportunity to do the real thing and get out then they should take it immediately Mm -hmm. so it's 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 a really personal thing where it's like what kind of person are you where are you in your stages of your career and a lot of times you don't know that being inside of it you Mm -hmm. know yeah and even just going to berkeley can be like a big like seal of approval for people yeah because like i think kenny beats went there mm-hmm. yeah and he's like one of my gods you know yeah he's Charlie like one Bruce, of my gabe simons john mayer lizzie mcalpine i mean they're yeah, i didn't know john went there yeah they're they're all famous berkeley alum and and uh but they also all of them dropped out all of them yeah dang yeah it's it's and that's nothing to do with berkeley it's yeah, just that just like opportunities you know you get the opportunities and if you're as talented as you are and you have those opportunities, then it's your responsibility to take them, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And I think school is only important until whatever else is on the other side is more important. Right. Cause like for me, like I kind of, like I did graduate, Mm -hmm. but it's not like, like if I knew it wasn't benefiting me, I would have left. Like I know it's just purely opportunity cost. Totally. But unfortunately a lot of internships you need to be in school for. Yeah. So, yeah, like every internship I had, I think, was like 
school credit or yeah because i was a student yeah so yeah my my internship was very diy <laughs> super DIY. please house me <laughs> you <Yeah>. know <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's really cool um and i guess a good parting remark is what do you think you've learned the most kind of just being here on the earth and going through music going through life and kind of mm. yeah where do you hope to be in the future oh that's a, that's a couple questions there um yeah. i'll start with it all. what have i what have i learned the most um gosh i've learned a lot and i feel like a lot of it is stuff i've internalized and mm. i haven't really had to express before but um I feel like oh man I'm gonna come back to that yeah what was, no, the, what was, what was the second thing you said um not really just what you've learned through life through music kind of where do you hope to be traversing all of that say even just like five years yeah um where do I hope to be I just hope to be in a place where I'm doing what makes me happy. You know, I right now and for as long as I can see myself existing, um, music is what makes me happy. And so if I'm doing something that I really enjoy and I'm finding enjoyment out of and I'm um, able to, to support myself financially off of it, then that's where I hope to be. You know, mm -hmm. if if one day I find that I don't see this ever happening, but if one day I find that music doesn't make me happy any more, anymore and I want to go explore and travel the world and that's what I'm happy doing, then that's where I want to be. You know, mm -hmm. I want to be in a place where I don't know. I, I would say the thing that I've learned the most is that doing music Music is a part of living that I really, really enjoy. And I found that my happiness comes from from feeling like I'm gosh, I don't know how to how to verbalize this, but it's more so thinking of music as not being my entire world and thinking of music as being the thing in my entire world. Like the vehicle to allow you to experience everything? Yeah, exact exactly. So I, I find that like my fulfillment has been coming from feeling alive and feeling like a human being and connecting with people and the world around me. And music mm -hmm. is that preferred vehicle to experience all of that. And so I feel like I've learned that. Whereas in the past, it was just like music is the one box that I need to be putting myself in. Mm -hmm. I don't know if any of that made sense, but no, that makes I'm trying sense. to express what I've been internalizing for so long and I haven't actually yeah. had to put to words, but yeah, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense because especially when you're building up to like be good at or established in something, like there's no place of comfort. Mm -hmm. Like that pursuit has to be your whole world. But then once you get there, you kind of realize it's finally now a part of you. And now it's kind of just figuring out and tapping in what, with what you've always been. Exactly. Yeah. I've really been feeling that a lot lately too. Mm-hmm. Cause just our younger years, we got to grind to yeah. get to where we are. Yeah. And there's almost no time to be yourself outside of it, yeah. which is crazy. But yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. thank you for being on. I really do appreciate your time. Thanks for and, having me. Yeah. And honestly, just being such a genuine person, both on and off the pod, like it's just nice to actually talk to somebody who I feel like understands a lot. I mean, you've experienced a lot of the things that I stress about like tenfold. So it's just cool to see you've hit that point and you're still aware of what's around you and just cognizant of the world. Well, thank you. It's just cool. I appreciate you having me here. And um, yeah, I just, I mean, I always had a good vibe about you from the moment we connected on the internet and mm -hmm. you're one of those guys that just seemed real. So I always try to grasp onto that and hang on to that when I can. Yeah, likewise, because, I mean, we talk to so many people all the time, whether it's a DM to somebody we meet in the industry. Yeah. And it's just nice that over, like, a year we've been able to stay in contact and yeah, totally. just really, like, support each other. And that yeah. just means a lot because it's not something that comes often, so. Yeah. 
yeah i'm just glad one you're here but two just that you're a great dude and oh thanks you <laughs> keep hold of that you know likewise man <laughs> likewise and uh where can people find you on socials and where would you want to um noah in the open on everything pretty mm-hmm. much i mean you can listen to my music now if you want but um just know that the good stuff is yet to come out <laughs> mm-hmm. so early is it next year yeah early next year yeah i can't wait yeah, yeah well i mean we'll definitely be covering it and i'll awesome. be supporting it and playlisting and everything that Thank i can <laughs> so um, and one other thing i do is i like to use a song by the person who comes on as the outro mm-hmm. so out of your songs that are out which song would you like to have as the outro um street fighter street, that's a favorite of mine yeah For sure. i love street fighter <laughs> i love the uh, spotify canvas of it oh when thank you're, like you. boxing and spinning on the yeah <laughs> my uh my buddy omri the one soul boy um mm-hmm. he's really into ufc and he like brought me and all my friends out to the to the field and was like all right i'm gonna i'm gonna teach you how to how to box and everything and so mm-hmm. that was just video <laughs> of me just playing around <laughs> yeah now i'm a big fan yeah thank so. you yeah, no, thanks for coming on, and uh, I'm excited next time you're in the city, next time yeah. we're in the same place. Cool. And yeah, here is Street Fighter by Noah in the Open. Awesome.